It was on this day a century ago the 19th Amendment was officially certified, giving women the right to vote in national elections. It was also a major achievement for the suffrage movement, which spanned decades and in most cases is condensed to a chapter or two in our history books. Tonight we want to honor Michigan's first woman elected to the state legislature, Eva McCall Hamilton. Voters sent her to Lansing that November in 1920, and her rise to the Capitol started in Grand Rapids. It's easy for us today to look at suffrage and say, oh, it was inevitable. Of course it was going to happen. They didn't know that. All of this was coming to a head in that last decade, and Eva McCall Hamilton was positioned just right. She argued for suffrage based on the idea that she believed it was a basic right. She's been a great role model, and uh, I'm just really pleased to be able to follow in her footsteps. It's been nearly a century since Greater Grand Rapids voters helped Eva McCall Hamilton make history in Lansing. But she was a trailblazer long before walking onto the Senate floor. So many people take it for granted that she just showed up at the Capitol on January 5th and suddenly became a senator. She had been here for years. Right from early on in her career in that last decade, she was working uh, city committees on city ordinances, famously about farmers markets, but other things too. The year was 1910. The teacher turned activist was among Grand Rapids women reviving local suffrage efforts through the Equal Franchise Club, somewhat of a new branding for the movement, beginning with a float in the homecoming parade. She was the woman who was driving the team of horses on this float in the Equal Franchise Club parade. But we talk about that era, that last decade, as one full of flash and spectacle, and they knew how to use the newspapers. Women always had, but in a different way. This was much more in your, in your face. That approach resulted in a suffrage takeover at the Grand Rapids Press four years after the local revival. Rather than making the headlines, Hamilton and other women were writing them. The press actually changed out its masthead in 1914 with an image that shows in Greek, you know, robes, flowing robes, women of the states who had been enfranchised with Michigan in the rear in shackles. She was the automotive editor. The takeover of the press had a lot of humor in it. There's a cartoon that shows men's positions on suffrage behind a fence in front of it or sitting on it. In the years following, Hamilton balanced her role in the suffrage movement with local initiatives and a platform earned during World War I. In April 1917, everything changed because there was a woman's committee formed as part of the Council of National Defense. And practically overnight, the network of women's clubs, the suffrage movement performed. And there were something like 17,000 women's committees that started up nationwide. These women could just pull out programs that they'd been working on for decades, but getting almost nowhere. Very rarely did they get something pushed through that they wanted for the welfare of people who otherwise had no voice. By that time, Hamilton had no problem using her voice, advocating for what we now know as farmers markets. She got a lot of publicity. It was reported that she whipped five aldermen. And she was a rather colorful figure. She'd go around everywhere with a basket of vegetables. Saying this to a reporter in 1917, the retail market will become a permanent institution in Grand Rapids. Early themes in her life had informed what she was doing in women's clubs um, in, during the suffrage movement and the World War I committees where they were working on, working on health issues and that carried her right to Lansing. This is an image actually of her sitting out on the Capitol's front steps, mm -hmm. which I've always found kind of amusing because ladies don't normally sit on the ground <laughs> in that era. Nearly 10 decades have passed since Hamilton's election in November 1920. Because this was such a watershed moment in America, her election actually received national coverage. She was trying to walk a fine line. There were a lot of men who were very unhappy that she was in the state Senate. And she had to initially say things like, I'm not here to start a revolution, I want to get things done. The portrait that sits in the Senate chamber is a reminder of the added obstacles Hamilton faced back then. There's discussions about what they're going to call her. Is she Mrs. Senator? Is she the lady senator? 
Even still, she did what she set out to accomplish in her one-term tenure. She's right here in the middle with her hat on, looking very proud. Successfully passing seven of the 12 bills she introduced, a notable one being a change to the Mother's Pension Act. And this act um, provided county assistance for single mothers, so mothers who were widowed, mothers who um, had dependent children. All the men are watching the governor. She's just smiling, saying, look, I'm the first woman in the state of Michigan to ever get my own bill passed. Hamilton was a Republican, but much of what she pushed for would be viewed as progressive a century later. Issues like food security, uh, which I was just appointed to, a commission that will be dealing with food security uh, issues. And it took nearly 100 years for a woman to once again represent Grand Rapids in the Senate. I urge you. With Senator Winnie Brinks' election in 2018. She was such a trailblazer. Uh, and, you know, everything from just the fact that she won an election uh, in that year, the first year that women could vote, uh, to the issues that she championed. I'm really proud that I get to uh, work with Eva in a way still every single day when I walk in here. Um, I always kind of look over there and give her a nod. I used to be a tour guide and I remember being, and this is in the early 2000s, um, rather shocked to have some children ask, can women make laws? And she's, she's evidence of that. We can point to her and say yes. Here's the first woman who did. And that's very important for children to know and children to see because it, it inspires. And we try to tell her story to remind little girls and little boys that the Capitol belongs to everyone in Michigan. We would like to thank the local history team at the Grand Rapids Public Library, the State Capitol Rare Book Room, and the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council for their help with making this piece happen. Two important things to note as well. One, Michigan women were enfranchised in November 1918. That's what set Hamilton up to run in the 1920 election. Otherwise, she likely would not have had enough time to get a campaign together and off the ground before Election Day. The second point, the 19th Amendment was not the end of the fight for voting rights. Voters of color still faced plenty of obstacles, including some from some of the leaders of the suffrage movement. The women's suffrage movement and had roots in the anti-slavery movement and many women's organizations were inclusive, but underlying racism was still present. Leaders like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton focused more on white women earning the right to vote over all women. Even as late as 1918, leaders of the National American Women's Suffrage Association leaned into white supremacy as a selling point. As Jim Crow laws in the South purposely kept black people out of the voting booth. Women like Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell are credited as leaders continuing the fight for black women. The biggest blow to Jim Crow laws didn't land until 1965 when Congress passed the Voting Rights Act. The fight persisted for Native Americans and Chinese Americans long after the 19th as well. And right now on our homepage, we take a deeper look at that history and share more historic photos from Hamilton's work a century ago.